So welcome everybody, this is Chris so Johnson here from the DPPC. Um, I'm just going to give a quick introduction to Justin. Um, he's going to talk about his ETSE project. Um, he's uh, joining us, I understand, from over in the US, so we've got some test papers, um, and it all seems to work okay. I'll hand over to Justin, who's going to tell you about his ETSE project. And just let us know as we go along, if there are any problems, and I'll keep an eye on the chat window. Okay, over to you, Justin. Okay, over to you, Justin. Thanks, Chris. So thanks for the introduction. Um, as Chris said, today I'm going to talk about my uh, ECS E project, which was uh, part of Archer last year. Um, and the title of this work is uh, libcfd to LCS, um, a general purpose library for computing Lagrangian coherent structures during CFD simulations. Um, <clears throat> so I want to start off just by uh, giving a couple, couple quotes that um, have sort of made it into the popular media uh, in, recent, in recent years. Um, so that everybody has kind of an idea of what Lagrangian coherent structures might be and why they might be important um, for the benefit of anyone who doesn't have a background in this area. Um, so in, in 2009, the New York Times covered, covered a, uh, a feature issue in, in the journal Chaos. Um, they, they quoted Jerry Marsden, um, who was at Caltech, and he, um, he said, basically, these structures are invisible in a flow because they often exist only as dividing lines between parts of the flow that are moving at different speeds and in different direction. They aren't necessarily something you can walk up to and touch, but they are not purely mathematical constructions either. The line is not a fence or a road, but it still marks a physical barrier. And then soon after that, the economists covered a similar, similar development and they said, these, uh, these Lagrangian coherent structures are the skeleton of water. And this is something that was paraphrased um, from an uh, article in TRL uh, by Mather et al., um, uncovering the Lagrangian skeleton of turbulence. So what, what are Lagrangian coherent structures? I think um, the easiest way to, to um, introduce this is really to consider a very simple example um, and prompt us to think about uh, coherence from perhaps different frames of reference, from the Eulerian frame, where we, where we observe the flow from a fixed location in space and time, um, or the Lagrangian frame, where we follow fluid parcels through space and time. And so the idea being that even chaotic flows display remarkable levels of coherence, but how this coherence looks, uh, and especially what it means for transport and mixing, really depends on our frame of reference. So. I've shown here a, a little vector field, two counter-rotating vortices in a, in a rectangular domain. Uh, this is often called the double gyre flow. Um, and it's used as kind of a toy example to try to understand a lot of geophysical flows. So if we consider the case where these two uh, vortices are steady, they're not moving in time, um, and we inject three little blobs of ink into the left-hand vortex, um, we can see what the flow will do to these, um, these blobs of ink as, as time goes on. So in a steady flow, these ink spots will get stretched, um, but they're all going to stay within this, this left-hand vortex. And so from a Lagrangian perspective, everything within this left-hand vortex is, is roughly coherent. Um, and so we can overlay on top of this a vector, uh, a, a continuous field, which I'm just going to call the Lagrangian coherent structure for now, being this, this dark ridge in the middle that divides the left-hand vortex from the right-hand vortex. And we'll talk a bit about um, how this is actually defined. But if we consider this dividing line the skeleton of this flow, then we can think about these two coherent regions on the left and the right um, dividing two different regions of behavior. Now, if we introduce a slight oscillation into the flow. Rather than having these two vortices be steady, we let them expand and contract a little bit in time. What we see is that uh, from a Lagrangian perspective, the coherent patterns uh, evolve much differently. So we see that the blue dot of ink has stayed in the left-hand vortex. The green dot has been entirely swept over to the right-hand side. And the red dot has been more or less split in two. So if we look at the corresponding Lagrangian coherent features in this flow, what we see is that there's a much more complicated pattern in these dark ridges in, in, this, um, in this contour field. Uh, 
so these are the types of features we really need to look at and understand if we want to understand time dependent transport patterns. I'll talk a bit more later about what these actually are and how we define them, but this is sort of the, the motivation for why we want to look at Lagrangian coherence rather than just Eulerian coherence, which is probably more prevalent. So in this talk, uh, what I'm going to talk about is a new numerical library called libcfd to LCS, uh, which is a general purpose library for computing these LCS. And in particular, we can now compute them with this library during a CFD simulation. So I'll give a little bit of background on what LCS are and how we compute them. And then more detail about specifically the lib CFD to LCS approach, which is um, taking advantage of an integrated computation within a CFD simulation. Um, I'll talk about how we can develop applications or, or simulation programs that use the library, um, and in detail, kind of key library functions that every libcfd to lcs application will use. Um, I'll let, finish up with a few demonstrations of what the library can do. Um, unfortunately, because we don't have time and there's, there's probably better resources for this, what this talk won't be is uh, a detailed overview of LCS theory or applications. Um, for anybody who's interested, there's a lot of really good review articles on the subject. Um, and it's also not going to be a complete step-by-step -step guide for using the library. There is a, a user's manual that's available on the web um, where you can see, to see in more detail um, how, how to exactly use, use the library syntactically and, and calling the functions and, and so on. So um, starting with roughly George Haller's work in 2001, um, this notion of Lagrangian coherent structures has kind of come out of dynamical systems theory um, and been refined uh, more or less continuously since then. It's still a, a field in progress, I think, in terms of, of where the theory is going. Um, but basically, we can, we can lay out some key points about what LCS are and their properties. Um, as I alluded to in those quotes in the beginning, uh, LCS uh, really have this, uh, this property that in an unsteady and a turbulent flow, they are the hidden skeleton that defines these, these mixing patterns. Um, the skeleton defines the boundaries of dynamically distinct regions. Um, and so these are sort of the boundaries of, of tracer patterns um, that we see when we, when we have dyes or pollutants or uh, different species that we want to track within a flow. Um, and we can identify this skeleton by finding the locally most attracting or repelling hyperbolic material lines. Um, and these are the lines that in a flow and in, in time, no transport is going to occur across these. So I've taken a little cartoon from some of Sean Chatham's work um, showing two, two little particles uh, at Time, time zero, x and y. Um, and we can think about these hyperbolic lines that exist in a flow. And these uh, are the lines across which no, no transport occurs. They are the skeleton of the unsteady, unsteady transport. And we see that in time, these, these trajectories diverge away from the line. Um, and so this is, this is the, uh, the type of flow feature that we're interested in. So there's been a lot of, um, a lot of insight that's been gained um, in, a, in a variety of different flows. Uh, by looking at LCS in detailed simulation and experimental data. I've shown just a few examples here of um, uh, some high profile work that was done after the Deepwater Horizon oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico um, using the drifter data that was available. Um, Gaga and Haller basically hindcasted the movement of the oil slick um, and related it to the, the Lagrangian coherent structures in, in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, there's also been work looking at, at uh, atmospheric events, um, shown down here, some, some work by Rickian and Ross. And then uh, even, even looking at granular flows, um, this is a, a cartoon, a, a result from, from Ivan Kristof's work of uh, segregation of two species in a rotating tumbler. So you have little particles and big particles, and the, and the rotating drum goes around and around. And these, um, these Lagrangian coherent structures, in this case, um, can be used to understand the segregation dynamics. So lots of, lots of new, new types of uh, applications or new, new insights that we can learn about a variety of different applications. Um, so there's, uh, there's been a lot of different ideas that have developed over the years about how we identify and actually um, compute the Lagrangian coherent structures. And I want to, I want to say that what I'm going to propose is that we think about the Grangian coherent structure diagnostics. So there's different ways to diagnose what the LCS are um, and how they involve in the flow. And I'm going to go through the example of the finite time Lyapunov exponent, which is 
a somewhat imperfect but common way to diagnose these. And um, as we'll see, this is sort of a, a good starting point um, for the more, more advanced and more recently proposed uh, diagnostics. So the first step to computing, um, to computing this, this diagnostic is basically to um, initiate and release a regular grid of tracers in your flow um, and integrate them through some finite time um, from the interval T0 to T1. So starting at T0, we let a bunch of tracers go. So we let them follow the flow up to T1. And this gives us the flow map, which I'm going to denote um, T here. So then we differentiate the flow map with respect to the initial tracer positions. And this lets us compose the right Cauchy Green deformation tensor, delta. So this tensor basically contains information about the local rate of, of stretching of the Lagrangian trajectories. And then one measure of, of how, how um, repelling or attracting these trajectories are um, is the finite time Lyapunov exponent, so the FTLE field, which I'm denoting here. Um, and this is basically a measure of, of how fast uh, adjacent trajectories are repelling each other in, in this finite time interval. So one way to diagnose the LCS using the FTLE is to look for these ridges, which you've seen in a lot of the, a lot of the images I've shown already, um, either visually or analytically. Um, if we do this integration in forward time, we can think about repelling LCS. Um, and if we do the integration in backward time, meaning we start at some current time and go backwards in the data, uh, we'll, we'll uh, end up with attracting LCS. So the particles will converge upon um, the backward time uh, LCS ridges. So there's, as I said, there's been a lot of refinements um, over the years, and um, people have, especially George Holler's group, have built upon uh, the FTLE and said, okay, well, this is a, this is a fairly easy to compute uh, diagnostic, but it's not perfect. Um, and there's been a lot of new proposals, uh, a new theory that's come out of that. Um, but unfortunately, a lot of it is quite more challenging to compute um, and maybe not even uh, easy to develop an algorithm to compute it. Um, fortunately, though, I, I think we'll, we'll get there. And for the time being, most, if not all, of the new LCS diagnostics end up requiring us to, to go through steps one and two, which tend to be the most computationally expensive steps um, when computing Lagrange incoherent structures. So, uh, this is the basis. If we can, can have a, a, a program or a library that can, can do this work efficiently, then we have a good building block to develop the, the theory as it evolves. So as I alluded to, um, there's a few computational challenges involved um, in the way that these are typically computed. Um, what, we, what we usually have is either results from a, a simulation or, or an experimental data set. Um, and so we we use a post-processing approach to to eject uh, particles through these these data sets or these snapshots of the flow in time. Um, and this this is relatively algorithmically simple, but but quite computationally expensive. Um, so we need to read all these these velocity fields in um, and do potentially an enormous number of particle ejections. Uh, and along the way, we need to store lots of velocity fields um, and, and, and flow maps as well. And if we want to do anything like, like animate uh, the evolution of the LCS, as I've shown on the right, you can see uh, the, the attracting FTLE field behind a, um, a cylinder, which is starting to uh, see vortex shedding. So in order to, to see this sort of phenomenon with LCS, we need to have several uh, snapshots in time of the FTLE field. So we have to re redo this entire procedure many, many times to have a nice, a nice animation. Um, so these are these are things that have probably prohibited the uh, the use of LCS, especially for for larger uh, larger scale and more complex data sets. Uh, there has been a lot of a lot of work to try to try to find ways to speed this up or make uh, make the process more um, <clears throat> more more easy to use and more uh, more efficient. Um, and the the one that I'm going to talk about today is some some work that I started a few years ago on integrating the whole computation within a CFD simulation. So this, this came out of some work that um, uh, was published in Chaos in 2013. And the whole premise was basically we want to ditch the post-processing uh, and compute 
LCS on the fly within the CFD simulation that we're doing. Um, so uh, if anyone's interested in the, in the details of, of the algorithm, uh, you can refer to this paper. But basically what we can do is we can embed the computation of forward or backward time FTLE fields uh, in the simulation as it evolves. This requires taking advantage of a few tricks which have been proposed in the last few years, um, specifically some rules about how you can compose flow maps um, and the, the fact that we can treat the backward time flow map um, as, a, as a collection of scalar fields. Um, but the result was that we were able to do this and, and get, get quite, quite nice results uh, with a modest additional overhead relative to the CFT simulation on its own. Um, and this, this really gives us a lot of advantages if we can integrate this in the CFT simulation because already we have a, a, a largely uh, massively parallel CFT code and so we can harness the parallelism of HPC, HPC systems like Archer to also do the LCS computations. Um, we also can reduce the errors involved in the, in the LCS computation that are due to things like uh, interpolation error uh, in space and time because we have much more, uh, <clears throat> much more detail in our, in our CFD simulation in terms of the available resolution of the velocity fields. And so these factors really uh, should let us tackle larger and more complex flows um, using LCS. And, and I think the outlook really is that uh, CFD and HPC capabilities um, should only continue to grow, and so if we have this integrated tool, um, the, the the limit to what we can what we can tackle with, with LCS is is, uh, is pretty high. So this is one of the the more complex examples that we've been able to look at. Um, this is a simulation of, of turbulent flow through a packed bed of spheres, um, and you can see that the slice through the the pore space, um, kind of in the middle of the bed and the variety of features we're able to pick up. This is just a snapshot in time, um, but we were starting to look at the dynamics of these, these Lagrangian uh, features in, in the pore space and, and their implications for, for mixing and dispersion within the back bed. So we had this in, a, in our sort of in-house flow solver um, when I was a PhD student at Oregon State. Um, and then uh, a couple of years ago, I thought, okay, well, this would be really nice if uh, I could uh, develop a more general purpose capability um, and, th and then others would be able to, to integrate it in their own, in their own simulations. Um, so this is how libcfd to LCS was born, was basically to think about how to generalize, generalize the approach um, and make it, make it a flexible tool that anybody could pick up uh, out of the box. So um, the key capabilities, the key, key things that I was, I was aiming to do with this uh, were to make an easy to use flexible API. Um, that hopefully requires little little modification for many many existing CFD solvers. Um, I want to allow any number of LCS diagnostics to compute to be computed simultaneously um, during during a simulation. Um, right now, the, the the library is compatible with solvers which use structured grids. Um, the grids can be orthogonal or non-orthogonal, but they do need to be um, globally structured. Uh, we have some user-specified grid refinement that can be done, and this helps us uh, refine the detail of the LCS if we want more than just um, the detail that's afforded from our native CFD grid. Uh, we have interfaces for C, C++, and Fortran. Uh, the whole library is, is uh, built on built on MPI, uh, so it's a distributed memory uh, platform, and, and we've already tested it up to 4,000 cores on Archer. Um, so, so. The hope is that this kind of interfaces well with a, with a large-scale CFD simulation. Um, and then the hope is that the, the development of the library can continue um, and that we can continue to add new LCS diagnostic types um, within a modular extensible code base. <coughs> so um, how do you get good CFD to LCS? Well, if you're already if you're already a user of Archer, it's, it's quite easy. Um, it's installed there. It's available as a module to all users. Um, <clears throat> basically, it's a three-step process. Uh, if you log into Archer, uh, the best thing to do um, is to load a sequence of modules that I've shown here. If possible, if you don't need a, a the Cray or the Intel programming environment for your for your code. I think it's best to use the, the GNU environment. This is only because it's the most tested 
uh, environment that I've used for the library. Um, hopefully, down the line, we can we can uh, better better test the other the other two environments. Um, you'll also need to load the HDF5 parallel library, and this is for the, the parallel input output. And then finally, load the lib CFD tail CF library itself. If you don't happen to be a user of Archer, um, a library, a user's manual, and several example programs are available on the web here. Um, so you can download this and build it on your own workstation or HPC system. There's fairly minimal dependencies. Uh, really what we need is uh, just working MPI, F90, and C compilers, uh, a LayPack library, and HDF5, which again is the for the parallel input output. This is uh, this is optional. Um, it's, so if you don't have that capability on your system, uh, there is a, a serial input output option as well. Uh, so there's there's also a basic build instruction and make file provided here. Uh, and this library is being distributed under the under the GNU public license. So now I'm going to summarize basically the, the steps you need to go through to to get libcfd to LCS working with your own code. Um, it, it's, I, I hope, quite straightforward because I've tried to make um, uh, most, of the, most of the things you need available as environment variables when, you, when you're compiling uh, with the library. So the first thing to do is pick up this makefile.in, uh, which contains definitions of, of includes and, and, and uh, libraries needed for linking. So if you have a, a make file for your for your application, on the top of that you can, if you're on Archer, just include um, CFD to LCS home make file dot um, If you're not on Archer or in general, you'll just include the path to the with CFD to LCS installation, and then the make file dot um, What this make file dot in contains is, is a few variables uh, that point to the, to the necessary include path in the library. So the next step is when you compile your object files that, that use, uh, use the library, we just include this include path um, in, in, the, in the compilation. And then when we do the, the linking, uh, we need to link with the CFD to LCS libraries. And there's, there's both single precision and double precision, very, uh, excuse me, double precision versions of the library available. So if your code works in singular double precision, uh, you can pass the data appropriately to the library. Um, and all you need to do is just choose the, the correct single precision or double precision variable here. And finally, um, in, the, in the part of your source code where you actually call the, um, the routines that are, are located in libcfd to LCS, uh, you'll need to include a header file kind of at the top of your uh, your definitions or, or, or the relevant spot, and this just picks up some some global variables um, and constants that are that are helpful. So here again, we have Fortran and C syntax uh, for single or double precision, depending on what your code uses. <coughs> um, in terms of learning exactly how to how to use it, the sort of the the way to develop applications that use CFD to LCS, I think the the easiest way to learn is really to look in the examples. There's some uh, some quite basic uh, example programs in the examples directory of the source code, um, and and you can follow these and, and see the sequence of calls that are made to the library in order to set up the LCS calculations. Um, <clears throat> so I've shown just here a, a bit of pseudocode to give you an idea of, of, of really the, the procedure involved. Um, so if this, is, if this is an entire user's application that, that basically represents a CFD simulation, again, at the very top, what we're going to do is we're going to include the CFD to LCS header file. And then probably the CFD simulation is going to go through a sequence of steps to initialize um, the simulation, like reading in grid coordinates, establishing boundary conditions, um, and establishing some domain decomposition if we're running a parallel simulation. Um, <clears throat> in order to then initialize uh, the CFD to LCS library to get it ready to do these LCS computations, um, there's a sequence of calls that I'll, I'll go into more detail, but basically these, 
these calls here. Uh, these are what we're going to to call to to set up the library. We're then going to start the simulation at time equals t start, and we're going to run the simulation until time equals t finish. And each time we go through this loop, we'll establish a new velocity field. Every every iteration or every step of our simulation, we'll get a new velocity field, uh, which I'll call variables u, v, and w. <coughs> um, we'll then update any CFD to LCS diagnostics that we've initialized. If we happen to be done with the diagnostic, we'll get rid of that and remove it from the computation. And we'll keep doing this loop until we're done with the simulation. And when we're all done with that, we can finalize the library and end our application. So this is really a sequence of what, what it, it's going to look like within your own application. And I'm going to talk now a little bit about each of these uh, these calls to the library, what they're doing, um, and what what it will mean for how you set up your own human simulation. So, <clears throat> the first one uh, that should always be called first whenever you're working with libcfd to lcs is this uh, this function cfd to lcs init, and this is going to initialize the communications and the memory on the library side uh, that are needed to to compute lcs diagnostics. Um, so I've shown up here the Fortran and the C syntax to uh, call this library, to call this function. And this has uh, a few arguments. The first one is going to be a, a global MPI communicator that uh, you're using in, in your application. So this typically would be MPI com world um, if, you, if you have uh, an MPI application. N is going to be the number of grid points for each uh, each processor in the x, y, and z direction. So as I mentioned before, we need to be working with a structured grid for now. Uh, there's no requirement on the ortho orthogonality of the grid, but it does need to be globally structured. So here I've, on the right, I've shown you know, this cartoon of a, a simple domain using four processors. <coughs> each processor has four grid points in x and eight grid points in y. Um, so we're going to share with the library each processor's uh, number of grid points and we're also going to share the local offset of each subdomain uh, within the global array. So you can see uh, in the lower left hand corner here this black grid has an offset of 0, 0. If we go to the right we have an offset of 4 and then 0. Um, and you can see how that, how that works in each of these subdomains. So this just lets the library know where each processor sits uh, within the, the global array arrangement. <coughs> uh, we're then going to pass the x, y, and z coordinates of this grid. Um, and so this will be arrays of size n1, n2, times n3. Uh, and this will just be the Cartesian coordinates. And then finally, we're going to pass an integer array that corresponds to a, a boundary condition for each grid point. So each of these grid points is going to have a tag associated with it. Uh, which allows us in the library to understand what kind of uh, boundary condition is at that point. There, if you look at the manual, there's several options um, that hopefully should allow us to do quite a variety of simulations or, or, or work with a lot of different conditions. So once, you, once you've initialized the library, really the next step is to initialize an LCS diagnostic. Um, and again, I've shown the syntax for this so one. So I don't LCS underscore diagnostic in it. I just did. I don't know if you just saw that there was uh, sorry, a so question. So Jane is asking, does this work yeah. with 2D grids? Uh, yes, Jane. Uh, thanks. I'll clarify that. Um, it does work perfectly fine with 2D grids. If you want to use a 2D grid, basically what you'll do is you'll pass N3 equals 1. Um, so it's set up to, to natively handle uh, three-dimensional arrays, and that's what all the data storage uh, is, is done in. But um, if you have a 2D grid, it'll just treat the third dimension as, as equal to one uh, within the library. So actually, there's a in the examples uh, directory there's there's a, a 2D um, a 2D program, so you can see how that's done. <coughs> Um, 
so the next thing to do really then is to, to initialize uh, these LCS diagnostics. Um, so we're going to do that with this call. Here we have uh, one, two, three, four, five, six arguments. Um, the first argument here is a return argument, an output that gets passed back from the library, which every time you initialize the diagnostic, uh, you're going to receive back an ID. And this just lets you kind of keep track of, of uh, which, which diagnostics you've, you've uh, initialized, um, and then you can, you can uh, end, end their computation later if you need to. <clears throat> the second argument is an arg argument I'm calling type. Um, and this, this is just uh, uh, a flag telling us what kind of LCS diagnostic we want to, we want to initialize. Uh, and currently the options are forward FTLE fields, backward FTLE fields, or Lagrangian particle tracers. So the third one is basically if you just want um, a set of, set of tracer particles uh, to be able to visualize your flow with, uh, you can initialize that with this option. Um, the third, the third argument is the parameter called res, uh, and this is this is uh, uh, an argument that lets us specify the refinement of the grid relative to your CFD solver's grid or your your grid at which the the velocity data is known. So there's an, there's an ability to either refine or take away some of the grid points. Um, <coughs> relative to the, to the grid that you know your data on. So on the right I've shown uh, with res equals zero, this is our CFD grid, so this is where we know the velocity field. If I pass res equals minus one, I'm going to take away every other grid point in each direction. And if I pass res equals positive one, I'll add a grid point in between each uh, CFD grid point. And so if I pass res equals two, I'll add uh, two more. Res equals three, I'll add three more in between each CFD grid point. So this gives you the ability to, to sort of adaptively refine um, your, your LCS um, to, the, to the detail that you need to capture. The, the next argument is uh, capital T, which is the LCS integration time. So this is the sort of the lifetime of the tracer particles that are used to compute the flow map. Uh, after that, we have little h, which is the interval at which we're going to compute or, or write the LCS diagnostic. So you can think about this as perhaps your animation interval. <coughs> and finally, uh, we're going to pass a, a string called label, which just gives us sort of a human readable way to identify each LCS diagnostic. So here it is an example. I'm going to create this diagnostic. Um, and I'm going to store the identifier in ID 1. It's going to be of type backward FTLE. The integration time will be 8 seconds. And I will write the FTLE field every 1 second. And I'll call this LCS1. The next, uh, I'll, skip, I'll skip that for the time being. Uh, the next important call really is uh, CFD to LCS update. So once we've initialized everything, we've initialized the library, we've initialized all our diagnostics, um, then we start our main flow loop of our CFD solver. And every time we update the velocity field, we need to call CFD to LCS update. <coughs> and what this does is it passes the current, <coughs> excuse me, the current velocity field in UV and W. So this is the same size as your grid. And these contain the x, y, and z components of the velocity. Uh, and then the library is going to update any LCS diagnostics that you've defined. And then time is just the current simulation time. So that, that's really the, the, main, uh, the main calls that you'll need to make to your library to get the computation running. There's also another important, uh, <coughs> another important subroutine that you can access called CFD to LCS set option. And this lets you uh, modify a number of accessible lib CFD to LCS options um, using a fairly straightforward string value or string constant um, <coughs> method. So basically, if we want to modify the integration scheme, I would pass a string called integrator and then a constant 
which I'll call RK3. And these are all defined in the header file that you, you load at the beginning of your program. So you can, you can look in the libcfd2lcs user manual and see all the options that are available to you um, and then use this, this key value type approach to, to modify these uh, as the simulation goes. So when the, when the simulation is actually running and you're, you're finally computing all these, these LCS diagnostics, um, the library is going to provide you a little bit of output um, every time after you, you call CFD2LCS update. Um, so here's just a screenshot of, of the output after, after one call of the update. So what this is telling me is that my simulation is now at time 0.668. I have created two Lagrangian particle sets to compute my LCS diagnostic. One's called forward FTLE, one's called backward FTLE. Each of them total four million particles. They're being advanced with a time step of 1.3 times 10 to the minus 2. And the, finally on the right, the N subcycle parameter tells me that I'm advancing them with a time step that is uh, <coughs> twice as small as the CFD uh, time step. And this is, this is handled adaptively within the code, and there's some tuning available um, to the user within the, within the CFD to LCS options. Um, below this, uh, in this, in this region here, uh, we're breaking down sort of what, what the library is doing and what it's spending its time on. <coughs> so you see there's, a, there's an application total, and this is in terms of wall clock time. Uh, and then there's a total CFD to LCS time. So we see at this instant, the CFD to LCS computations are taking roughly 38% of the total application overhead. And then this is further broken down into, into several, uh, several categories of, what, of what's going on. And finally, at the, at the bottom, you can see the total number of, of particle integrations for this step and then a cumulative count. So this is just some output that you'll get when you're, when you're running a, an application with the library. Um, in terms of the data that, that's output and for the results, um, all results are going to be written to a library or a directory called CFD to LCS output, which gets created in the folder that your, your application lives in or your executable lives in. Um, and as I mentioned before, a new file is going to be written for each LCS diagnostic at every time interval, little h. So this is, this is the frequency is controlled through that H parameter. <coughs> There's two input-output models that are possible depending on your, your system and whether or not you have parallel input-output capability with HDF5. Um, if you want to build a library with HDF5 support, um, so a single file, multiple writers uh, type model, we'll say HDF5 support equals true. I've, I've I have a typo here. This should be true in the first one where we have HDF5 or parallel I.O. And then if we have serial I.O., meaning we have a single file but only a single writing process, uh, we can compile with HDF5 support equals false in the makefile.in. And this will build two different versions of the input-output uh, capability. Both formats are readable by, by common visualization programs, so MATLAB, TechPlot, et cetera. Um, and hopefully it, it's, uh, it's a fairly straightforward format to, to work with. So that's, that's really, that's really the, the details about how, how you can use the library and, and what you need to do to get it running. I'll just now quickly give you a couple of um, examples of what, of what I've been working on and what, what my collaborators have been working on with the library. Um, as I said, this, this really, I think, opens up the doors to uh, a lot of larger scale and more complex uh, simulations. Uh, and my, my collaborator, Andrew Lowry, who's a lecturer at the University of Bristol, he's been, he's been working with a code of his to do um, jet and Rayleigh Taylor instability simulations. So I, I've shown on the right here an animation, and hopefully this will come through on the, uh, <coughs> on the web. This is a sort of a turbulent breakdown of a jet that's being simulated on a 128 by 128 by 256 cube grid. Um, and I've even refined the grid beyond that for the LCS calculations. Um, so I think we're talking in the neighborhood of uh, uh, 50 or 100 million 
particle advections for each of these LCS calculations. Um, and so this is this is quite a uh, quite a large number in terms of overhead for the for the particle advection calculations. But this is something that we can tackle now if we have access to the HPC system to run uh, to run the calculation on. We've also looked at uh, some pseudo spectral turbulence simulations with my my colleague Roman, uh, who's in Naples. Uh, I've been working on some sediment transport applications. Um, and finally, I'll show you that we can also use this library simply to use the post-processing approach. Because the library is all built on MPI, we can develop applications um, to post-process data sets that we already have, um, such as uh, this data set, which is from a, a regional ocean model simulation of uh, the Tyrrhenian Sea between, between uh, Italy and Sicily. So this is... Uh, an animation showing that the LCS and their evolution over roughly a 40-day period, um, <clears throat> and so this was all this was all done by loading in the data that was already existing into the library, um, and then computing it as as we typically would in a post-processing approach. So you can see that actually the library can work in the old school way as well as this integrated approach uh, with with the simulation. Um, in terms of performance, what I've seen is that uh, the overhead of computing the LCS relative to your simulation is really going to depend on, uh, on how expensive your simulation is to run. Um, but if we want to compute one or two FTLE fields with roughly the same level of detail as uh, the hydrodynamic simulation, we're looking at approximately perhaps 30 to 50 percent of the simulation time. And this, again, really depends on parameters and, and the, the specifics of the solver you're using. But all in all, I think this is a relatively affordable way uh, to get LCS type results and, and to be able to use this, this type of technique to analyze new data. So to summarize, uh, We've talked today about libcfd to lcs which is a new platform for computing Lagrangian coherent structures. Uh, crucially, this has the capability to be integrated into your own MPI CFD solver or post-processing utility. Um, I think it's a quite simple, relatively easy to use interface, uh, and it's flexible enough that, that it can be developed in a variety of solvers uh, and can be called from C or C++ or Fortran. Um, and I think this is exciting because there's really lots of new applications that we can explore now uh, using HPC and a variety of CFD codes. So moving forward, um, I, I'm hoping to be able to continue to develop this project um, and, and include things like, like inertial particles uh, to understand dynamics of, of, uh, of those uh, in, in inertial Lagrangian coherent structures, uh, as well as some of the newer diagnostics uh, and keeping up with with the developing theory uh, as it continues to evolve. So again, I have to thank uh, the the Archer National Supercomputing Service for funding this project uh, through the Embedded CSE program. And again, mention that this is a, a collaboration between uh, myself and Roman Watteau and Andrew Lowry. So uh, with that, I, I think I'll finish. And if there's any any questions, I'll, I'll take them either through the chat or or uh, if you want, if you want to speak to me, that's fine too. So, thank you. So many thanks, Justin, for that. So, as Justin said, if anybody has any uh, questions, so as said, if anybody has any questions, uh, please just just type them in, uh, or even uh, talk. Or your talk on you should be able to talk on the blackboard, and yeah. it will. Uh, everyone should be able to hear it. Okay, so if nobody has any questions, oh, okay, there's so one. Um, any questions, oh, there's one. in just from um, Chris Wilson there. Put in just from Chris Wilson there. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks, Chris. So Chris asked, um, I imagine that it's easy to generate a lot of output with diagnosed FTLE. Is there a way to set a threshold and output only the maximal ridges? That is a good question. Um, presently, the library is going to output the entire 
3D field of whatever diagnostic you initialize. And you're right, uh, if you have a large, uh, a large data set or a large domain, the output can grow quite quickly. Um, that's a good idea, and that's something I'll definitely think about how we can implement that right now. Um, the good thing is that if you have the parallel uh, HDF5 uh, capability, these are these are written at least to binary files, um, and they're they're uh, relatively uh, relatively small and they're compressed. So, um, yeah, hopefully we can figure out a way maybe to reduce the output in the future. But as of right now, everything gets written. So Jane again is is asking a question. She says, "I wonder about the time integration." Um, could this be used with implicit time integration? Um, yes, good question. Right now, all of the um, all the velocity integrations that are done by the library happen independently of the CFD solver. So I think this is I think this is what you're asking, Jane. And, and please clarify if, if I'm if I'm getting this wrong. Um, the, the library doesn't really care how you how you integrate the flow um, to obtain your velocity field uh, in your CFD solver. Um, within the library itself, the integrations are done in an explicit framework. Uh, you can choose different integrators with different orders of accuracy, um, ranging from first order order up to, to RK4, if you're interested in that. Um, they it could be possible in the future uh, if somebody's interested in, in working on it to to add an implicit integration within the library as well. Um, but right now those are all explicit, um, although it should not matter what your CFD code is doing in terms of time integration. So I hope that hope that answers your question. Okay. So do we have any final questions? Okay. So. Um, okay. So thank you very much, Justin. Um, that was a very interesting thank talk. Thank you very much, um, Justin. That was a very so, interesting uh, talk. Thanks for um, um, so presenting uh, that. Um, presenting and that. thanks for everyone for coming yeah, along. I'm sure you can catch up with Justin by email, 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 email if you have any further so questions. So thanks to everyone. Um, so and thanks see to everyone. you at the next webinar. Great. Thank you, Chris.